In the 1960s and 70s, there were many, many reports of alien abductions. People said, I, the aliens came to me and they brought me in and then they released me. Do you have any footage? No, they took my camera. Or no, they zapped my, my film and now there's no image on the film. But there were countless stories. Well, now you can stream live from your camera anything that's going on in front of you. So if the aliens come and they want to abduct you, stream it. That would be instantly viral. Oh my gosh. You know, the stuff that goes viral is much less than that. A cat, that, a kitten that jumps to the table and falls, that goes viral? You don't think a video footage of an alien is not gonna go viral instantly? But there's none. So I'm just saying, I'm thinking, if we were being visited, somebody would have some good footage. If we were being visited, I'm thinking maybe Google satellite images would catch sp spaceships that are not airplanes moving on our surface. If we were being visited, I'm thinking we'd have something better than fuzzy monochromatic video of, of, of objects that apparently reveal themselves only to Navy pilots, right? Tyson makes a great point about the lack of compelling UFO footage in the age of smartphones and instant sharing. His challenge is clear. Where's the hard evidence? With all our technology, we should have crystal clear images of alien spacecraft by now. The absence of such evidence in an age of advanced technology raises serious questions. While the possibility of extraterrestrial life is intriguing, we need to be grounded in verifiable data and scientific rigor. Perhaps aliens are visiting, but choose to remain hidden. Or maybe the lack of evidence points to a more terrestrial explanation. The search continues, but extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence. So when we compare ourselves to chimps, we sit up righteously and say, well, we have poetry and the Hubble telescope and philosophy, and the shrimp just stacks, stacks boxes to reach a banana. Yet there's only 1% difference in our DNA. But then you'll say, what a difference that 1% makes. And I would say maybe that 1% DNA difference corresponds with an equally small difference in the intelligence between a chimp and humans. And you say, I can't believe that. No, no, no. Well, imagine some other species that visits us, that's 1% along on that same scale. Smarter than us, consider. The smartest chimp does what our toddlers can do. And there's no way you will explain to a chimp, oh, I'll have dinner ready at 6.30, can you pick up some, some juice on the way home? That the simplest human thoughts are inconceivable to a chimp. And their talents are about what our toddlers can do. So let's get back to this 1% smarter alien that we've discovered. Corresponding this analogy, we now say, what would we look like to them? Well, they would roll Stephen Hawking forward after combing the human species, and they'd say, this one is slightly smarter than the rest because he can do astrophysics calculations in his head like little Timmy over here. And maybe they, to them, it is obvious what dark matter is and dark energy. Maybe to them, particles popping in and out of existence is a trivial exercise in their understanding of the multi-dimensional space-time continuum. And we are here groping at the sides of a wall, not knowing how tall, wide, or deep it is because we have the limits of the human physiology. This chimpanzee analogy cleverly highlights the potential limits of human intelligence. Just as we can grasp concepts a chimp can't, there may be realities beyond our comprehension, making us the toddlers to a more advanced species. This is both humbling and inspiring, urging us to stay curious and question everything. While we should be proud of our achievements, we must acknowledge how much we don't know. The universe is vast and full of mysteries. Perhaps with continued exploration and open minds, We'll unlock those secrets and even encounter those 1% smarter beings someday. If an alien landed right in front of us and said to you, Theo, take me to your leader, are you going to take him to the White House? Are you going to take him to Congress? No. No. I happen to be a scientist, but if I were not a scientist, I would take him to a scientist. A biologist or a, a, a physicist, I have a periodic table of elements mm -hmm. that are elements across the universe. 
I know mathematics that and laws of physics that apply across the universe. They got here from across the universe. If you're going to start with a language, like, oh, this is a cup and this is a fork and this is a, it's like, this is our elements. And this is what we call this uh. aluminum. We call this and they will know. And they start to develop a common vocabulary so that you can communicate with them because they're not going to speak English, nor French, nor Mandarin, none of the above. Mm. That being said, if they send radio signals here, the largest radio telescope is going to pick it up first. The largest radio telescope in the world is in China that will hear, hear the signal sent by aliens will be Chinese astrophysicists. But we're talking about if they visit. So if they visit, I'm saying bring them to a scientist. The okay. scientist will know how to think about and pose questions to them. Neil is right. If an alien landed, we should take them to a scientist. Scientists know the universal language of math and science, which would help us communicate. It's like, imagine trying to talk to someone who doesn't speak your language. You might point to things and try to use simple words, but it would be much easier if you both knew some basic sign language or had a translation app. Science is like the universal translator for the universe. Plus, scientists are trained to think logically and ask the right questions. They could learn a lot from the alien visitor and maybe even teach them a thing or two about Earth. I don't think all life forms in the universe have the basal, uh, primal, violent attitudes that we do as a species. I've not been given reason to think so. If you're a civilization that colonizes the galaxy, that it's a self-limiting exercise. Why? Because here you go, you ready? We start here on Earth. It's you and me, boy, all right? And you take that planet, I take this planet. And now we have both have offspring that are just like us and we want more planets, all right? We reach a point where expansion is not possible because we are warring with ourselves to gain the territory that each other has obtained. So it has been argued sociologically that the very act of wanting to colonize is self-limiting against successful colonization of the galaxy. Because to colonize the galaxy it has to be done in an organized way, all right? You take this sector, I take this sector, but if I want territory and I want it now, and my kids want it now, I want that territory, not this other one. In fact, I want it all. That kind of attitude breeds violence. It breeds war, intragalactic war. So it may be that the very kind of civilization that could peacefully colonize a galaxy is not the kind of civilization that would colonize the galaxy at all. What if the very drive to colonize the galaxy makes a civilization self-destructive? He draws a parallel to human history, where expansion often leads to conflict. This echoes the Great Filter Theory, which suggests there's an obstacle preventing civilizations from reaching a stage of galactic colonization. Perhaps it's this inherent tendency towards self-destruction. This makes you wonder, if we encounter aliens, will they be peaceful or conquerors? Or maybe their very survival means they've overcome this tendency. Perhaps the key to galactic colonization lies in cooperation, not conquest. It challenges our assumptions about advanced civilizations. Other than salt, animals have to kill to consume food, other than the consumption of salt. Everything else you eat was once alive. Unless you live off of milk and honey, you have to kill something. I don't, and even the vegetarians even the vegetarian was are alive. slaughtering carrots and slicing them, dicing them up, and shredding them. Yes. So the fact that we have to kill other life forms on our own planet for our own sustenance could easily be seen as one of the most barbaric things to another civilization where they all absorb energy from their host star. He highlights that on Earth, survival is inherently intertwined with taking life in some form, even if it's just a carrot or a leafy green. This might seem natural to us, but as Tyson suggests, to an advanced alien civilization that has moved beyond this need, our way of life might appear deeply primitive. What makes this concept even more intriguing is the idea that life beyond Earth might not rely on consuming other organisms at all. Instead, they might have found ways to harness pure energy, 
perhaps directly from their star or another sustainable source. If you want to communicate uh, with intelligent aliens across the gaps of space, uh, you would use things that move at the speed of light. Radio waves have good sort of penetration properties of interstellar gas clouds and this sort of thing. All right, so now let's find a planet and send a radio signal. Well, that radio signal is going to have to arrive there at a time where they have not only intelligence, but technology. Suppose some other civilization was sending us radio waves and it arrived 200 years ago. Presumably, we would have counted ourselves among the ranks of intelligent creatures in the universe at that time, but we would have had no capacity to receive radio waves because radio waves weren't discovered yet. And so, in fact, if you want to communicate with a civilization, it has to be right in the slice of time where they, where the life on that planet achieved intel complexity and intelligence and technology. And maybe technology is not a forever thing. Maybe technology escalates to the point where it becomes so dangerous that they render themselves extinct. So perhaps there's only a narrow window over which you could actually have a radio wave conversation with aliens. Tyson's point about the challenges of interstellar communication is fascinating, especially his insight into the timing problem. To successfully communicate with an alien civilization, not only would we need to aim a signal across vast distances and obstacles like interstellar gas clouds, but the timing would have to be just right. The recipients would need to have reached a technological stage that allows them to detect and interpret radio waves Consider the vastness of cosmic history. Civilizations might appear and vanish before their signals even reach each other. If aliens had sent us a radio signal 200 years ago, we would have missed it simply because we hadn't yet invented the technology to detect it. This suggests that even if the galaxy is teeming with intelligent life, we might still be struggling to connect because of this misalignment in technological timelines.